I hope everybody's been having a good time. At least it's not 99 degrees today, which makes it a lot nicer, that's for sure. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we started thinking about when I was going to speak here, could have been a lot of different things, but I think the thing that was the most important thing to talk about right now, given the circumstances, is the importance of preserving the skilled trades in the 21st century. When I started to think about this, I first wanted to give a definition to skilled trades. And if you look that up, there's a lot of different things that are said. And certainly, skilled trades, let's say in 1830 versus skilled trades today, but the list is much different. I mean, it's all, it includes everything we have here, but on top of it all, there's a whole realm of skilled trades that developed uh, since that time. So here's what I came up with. I said, a skilled trade is a particular occupation that requires education, either vocational or technical or both, on-the-job training, in our, and in our modern culture, continuing advanced education and learning. And really nothing new. Once you learn a skilled trade, there are always going to be new things that come up that you have to learn more about. And I always feel, feel that people who are in the skilled trades are great resources because they are the best people to continue to develop techniques for the skilled trades. All the good ideas come out of people who work in the trades, not so much from someone sitting in an office. So when you think about um, how important are they, they're really very important. In fact, if it were not for skilled trades, our lives might be pretty miserable. I mean, can you imagine not having any carpenters or plumbers or electricians or automobile mechanics, uh, appliance repair people? If we didn't have that, how would we, how could we possibly go about living a comfortable life? So they are very important, and that's just a short sample of some of them that are out there. Old Strange Village is actually an example how how important the skilled trades are, were, were, were to everyday life. I mean, if you look around when you were walking through the village over the last few days, you see a blacksmith, a tinsmith, a potter, a shoemaker, and all the other demonstrations. What, what do you think the village would be like if it didn't have these people as part of the population during that period? I have no idea. But it wouldn't have been very good. So. Uh, today, there's an endless list of skilled trades, and they are as important now as they were in the early days of the Republic. Now, there are technical trades today. And, you know, the interesting thing about technical trades is they can go overseas. They can be in an office someplace, because there are skilled trades that are very technical. They're not so much hands-on. But hands-on skilled trades, they're not going anywhere, at least not in my lifetime, I hope. They're always going to be here. They're going to be the people who help make our lives comfortable. They're also going to be the type of people that may inspire you to get into a skilled trade, or at least as a hobby, um, moving forward in things you might like to do. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about my career, because that's where I, I'm the most comfortable um, type of skilled trade that I have been working in in the last, well, it started when I was nine. <laughs> and I'll be 68 this year, so it's been a while. Um, but my, my career has been in residential remodeling, construction, as well as woodworking, and that's the world I'm most familiar with. But there are many other skilled uh, trade areas, and the advancements of those skills take a very similar path to the path that I took. Um, so today I'll tell you a little bit of my, about my journey and share my concerns and ideas about the future of the skilled trades. Now, my learning was not from shop class, believe it or not. I went to a parochial high school, parochial grammar school. We had no shop programs, no home economics, none of that. I would not be here today if it were not for my father. Now, my father was a carpenter, and I was by his side all the time from a very, from a very young age. He was my mentor, and he guided me. The way he guided me uh, became the blueprint of how I would pass my skills on. 
You know, you start from the beginning. As a, as a builder and a carpenter, you don't start doing finished carpentry. You start digging holes. <laughs> digging a hole for a foundation was where it started in that whole process. And you might say, oh, it's just digging a hole. It's more than that. There's a right way and a wrong way. There's an easy way and there's a hard way. And one of my stepkids, he was one of the kids who he'll never succeed in the trade. No matter how much I tried to teach him the right way to do something, he would always choose the most difficult way. And you know, some of the trade work is very, is very demanding, but uh, on the other side of it, it's very, it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding at the same time. Now, my first toolbox was a handy handy toolbox. <laughs> And some of you might remember that name. Uh, it, it was interesting. You would never be able to sell that toolbox today to young children. It had a real saw, a real chisel, a real hammer, and it had all the things that most people don't want to see their, um, you know, eight-year-olds playing with. And for me back then, I would just take pieces of wood and, my, and build things for my sister. We had a sandbox, a little summer cottage we had, and, and I said, oh, I'll build my sister a stove. You know, and there was all this lumber around and things that I could work with. So I put it together. And it was crude <laughs> by all means. But hey, again, you got to start from somewhere. And I always felt that even with our programs, we weren't necessarily telling people they had to do the things we were doing. We were trying to inspire them to get interested. Um, the other thing was understanding hand tools. And uh, I wish this book was still available, but I did this book. Measure twice, cut once. And really, it's an ode to my father. And it was all about the things I learned from him concerning tools, measuring, using chisels, crowbars, sharpening a pencil when you're a carpenter, all those kinds of things. If you can find one on eBay and you'd like to take a look at it, it's, I think it's well worth it. It was the easiest book I ever developed. I basically put it on a tape recorder while driving back and forth to work. And my book agent kind of put it on in, into little disc at the time. <clears throat> and we ended up producing this book. And uh, of the books I've done, I think this is the best and also the most helpful to anyone who's interested in getting into trades. So understanding the tools is part of the process. The journey. I think today, sometimes people, young people, think that they can learn a few things from a book and then go into the field and be a skilled craftsman or a skilled worker. And that's not the case at all. I think you have to have both. You have to have the classroom time, and you learn the most when you're in the field, because that's when you're in the real action and the real things going on. You have to be patient. And that was one of the things that my father always taught me. Because when you get impatient, you make mistakes. And for me, the one thing that drove my patience is, I wanted to have all my fingers in the end. So, <laughs> I was very respectful of any power tools or any tool at all. And, and you know, doing it right and being respectful and being patient is like, if your chisel is not sharp, you got to be patient. You stop your work, you sharpen your chisel, and you go back to work. Because you can hurt yourself more with a chisel that is dull than one that's sharp. So you know, patience was something my father told me. If you'll, you'll end up spending more time trying to complete your project if you rush it and make mistakes. And, and the satisfaction of building and learning that way is that, in the end, you end up with a successful project or a successful job completed. So really, starting from the beginning is very important. Now, <clears throat> when I had my company, when I first started working with young people, I didn't have too much trouble finding people who were interested in the skilled trades in the early 1980s. And they were willing to learn, and I was willing to teach them. And that part of it was very important, the teaching part. And as I said, my father's way that he mentored me created that blueprint. I would be very patient with my people. I would tell them that if there was something that I was asking them to do that they didn't understand, that it was better for them to come back to me and say, I don't quite understand what you want me to do, and let me explain it. Uh, I would like to not know the number of two by fours on a house that we have drawn, I have drawn sketches of how something was meant to be put together and how I wanted to do it. And often for many of those people, a visual 
approach was a much better approach than any other. However, I did have one rule, is that you never make the same mistake twice. <laughs> but that'll get you a raise, you make the mistake. If you make the mistake again, well, we'll have to think about that a little bit more. <clears throat> so the reality is, is that those of us who have ability in the skilled trades, our job is to keep the valuable lessons alive that we have learned from those before us and use them as the foundation for advancing the skilled trades of the future. What's sad right now is that we have a crisis in the skilled trades. And I'm going to use the, again, I'm going to use the building industry as my model because that's the one I'm most familiar with. There are, in the building industry alone, five million unfilled jobs in skilled trades. And people have come up to me after we made that point and said, I had no idea that that was happening. But if you talk to contractors, and ask, ask them what their biggest problem is. Their biggest problem is finding qualified help. And if you say to homeowners, have you ever tried to get a plumber or an electrician lately? They go, yeah, it's really tough. They said, well, that's the crux of the problem right there. We don't have enough people. Right now, the economy is booming. There's a bigger demand than ever. But inevitably, there'll be ups and downs. And I think what happened, why we got into this mess, is when things kind of went south, especially when they went south in 2008, because there wasn't enough work, and attitudes started changing, changing as well, even before that, where vocational technical schools were considered by a lot of parents to be <coughs> unworthy for some reason. And a, a plan started that felt that everyone should have a four-year college degree. Now, I'm not against education in any way, believe, believe me. I went to college. My father wanted me to go to college. But ultimately, I, I sought what I enjoyed doing the most. But I think what's infor unfortunate is that we're losing opportunities to get people into the skilled trades because there's, a, um, there's just a wrong interpretation of what the skilled trades are all about. So. That's kind of where it got started. And so what's the solution? I think there are several things to look at. One is public perception of the skilled trades. I think a lot of people have a, I don't know, maybe it's a little harsh to say, but I think the skilled trades are sort of second class citizens. And I hear so many stories from tradesmen who I know who have skill, who feel that when they go to someone's house and they work, that they're not respected in any way. People, homeowners don't communicate with these people. These people have, have everything we need to help us fix and maintain our homes and be comfortable. So I always try to encourage homeowners to, to understand the skills that these people have. So I think generally, we have to educate the general public about uh, the value of the skills and maybe they'll understand why, um, why we need more. Parents, as I've already said, um, pushing their children in only one direction, I think is a big mistake. Uh, a few months ago, I was at an art opening with my wife, and this woman came in to me and she said, I want to tell you a story about my son. He started watching this old house when he was a very young age, and he just loved to build things. And one day he asked her if there was something he could do for her, and she said, well, I would like to have a patio door off the kitchen. And he said, yeah, I think I can do that. Long story short, this young man puts the door in place, continues pursuing what he loves to do, starts his own construction business, has a website of his own, does mostly remodeling work, and I said to her, I need his name, <laughs> his phone number, his email address, because he is exactly the type of people we're looking for. Um, I wanted, you know, so that we can interview him and say, what drew you to this? What is it you like? What, what is it that makes you love this, this occupation that you have? And I have not yet to meet him personally, but he did make it into one of our magazines as one of the highlighted uh, young people working in the trades. So um, those are the kind of stories that we want to tell. I often say to people, 
you know, us as older adults, we can tell young people that it might be great to be in the skilled trades, but when you hear it from someone your own age, sometimes it goes over better than it does from the parents. Um, so, so we're going to try to build that, that, those stories. The other thing is that we realized when we started looking into this skilled trades issue is that the number of college graduates who now realize that maybe they should have explored a little bit more, not necessarily their fault, I would say, but they get out of college, they have a degree, they don't have a job, they're in debt up to their ears, and they don't know what to do. And fortunately for us, who appreciate the skilled trades, those people are starting to move into the skilled trades. And a lot of them are realizing that this is probably where I should have been in the first place. So I think what we have to do is we have to educate parents and the general public to be a little bit, to be more than respectful to the trades, but also be a little bit more relaxed and give our own children or grandchildren the, the ability to explore other things that we've taken away. When shop and vocational schools or vocational classes were removed from the public school systems in mass, that was a big that was a big cause of the problem. My opinion is that unless a young person can touch a piece of wood and work with it and smell the wood, like when we walked into the um, over into the uh, conference room, and as soon as I walked in there, that smell of the pine, you know, once you get that in your blood, you get it up, uh, just like it is walking into a house that's just been framed up. So, you know, so where, where do we go with that? Well, here at Sturbridge, we're going to have a charter school soon. And not that we're going to have uh, three-year-olds building houses or building cabinetry, but um, having them be in the village, work with the interpreters, touch, smell, see things, work with their hands and their minds, I guarantee that out of the, those people, there will be a certain percentage of them that will pursue some kind of skill trade. Um, we think about it, and we work on houses and so forth. I think about it in three ways. Uh, I did a little scene with Tommy Silva's nephew for the show where we had a problem to solve, a <clears throat> construction problem. And when we, when we got it done, our comment was, we use our minds to analyze the problem and consider a way that we can move forward with executing a, a solution. We use our hands and our skills to actually do the work. And at the end of the day, we have something we can look at that we're proud of. It doesn't get any better than that. Um, it's interesting that, come on, it's just interesting that we, Again, I just want to go back to the public perception. I think that's one of the biggest things that we have to we have to come beyond. I also think we have to start at a younger age with these children. I think we missed a whole generation of kids because they didn't have vocational arts in the schools. They didn't have any exposure to skilled trades. And I would, and that's why I think with the with the village here and the charter school, the younger we can get to them, the better it's going to be. And again, not everybody's going to like it. But if you don't have an opportunity, you'll never know. You'll never know for sure whether you're going to love it. Um, you can make a good living in the trades, and you can get a lot of satisfaction out of um, the accomplishments that you, that you achieve while you're doing the work. Now, for, for us to move forward with it, and one of the things I'm going to ask you is maybe for a little bit of help in a couple minutes, but. At this old house, we started, we started an initiative last year called Generation Next. And that's our attempt to get more exposure to the skilled trades. And a lot of what we're going to do, if you know any young people who seem like they don't know what direction they want to go in, I would encourage you to push them in that little direction, at least take a look at what we're trying to do. What we did is um, we partnered with a foundation. Uh, it's called MicroWorks. Uh, work ethic foundation. Uh, we didn't have the funds to create a foundation, but we wanted to raise scholarship money. So last year, our people raised half a million dollars that we presented to Mike Rowe and his foundation in January. 
And all of that money he has promised us will go to scholarships for people in the skilled trades. We, in fact, did a nationwide casting call, which I was not, I, I'm happy we did the casting call, but I wanted to give a word of caution to our, our advertising staff. When they, I noticed on the website, they said, want to be on TV? Um. I said, ha, ha, ha. that's not the right message. This is not about being on TV. This is about learning a trade. This is about learning. This is not about doing a TV show. And I hope they get that through. I even talked to one of the producers, and I said, I hope when you do these little segments that we follow the model that we've used all along, which is to try to educate and teach people not dictate to them what they should know, rather than suggest why we do the things we do and give them a little bit of freedom to maybe be creative on their own. So we have three students, uh, apprentices, coming to the Massachusetts area who will be here for 10 weeks, and uh, they will be on site on, on the active, this old house project. And not only will they be there, but every contractor on the job is being told that they have to have an apprentice on site for the whole project. And we will fe feature these young people. Not so much that we're gonna, we just gonna, we wanna show them in the environment. That's pretty much it. And we'll feature them in the magazine, the TV show, the website. And if you watch this old house, we do an hour where in, the, in between we have these little videos. <clears throat> And we call them 207s because they're two minutes and seven seconds long. And hopefully some of those will be interviews with these young people or where Kevin might sit down with them and say, you know, why are you here? What do you love about this? And again, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, whereas I think we can be more effective having young people encourage young people instead of uh, just adults. I think it has to come from young people. We have to get this away from them. <laughs> now, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with technology. I use it all the time. I never thought I would ever have a, an iPhone, and now I'm up to like the best one I have. But it, it does help me when I'm at work and I need you know, information or I have business things to take care of. But we want their heads down at a workbench mm -hmm. or soldering pipes or running wires in a house. That's what we want to do. And from where I started about the tools, that's one of the most important things they have to learn is to work with the tools. Now, even working with traditional tools actually uh, doesn't, it really brings you to the past and it shows you the types of things that we used to, to do the work back then. We all know that technology is going to take grip of a lot of this, but for a woodworker, um, I think working with hand tools as an apprentice or as an intern somewhere is a good way to get started in the trade because that, that gives you a good basis. I was at a, I was at a uh, production plant uh, that was, talk about high tech, cutting curved rafters for one of our projects with, with a computer and a CNC machine. I asked the owner, I said, how did you get this person, your operator, uh, how did you train him to run this machinery? And he said, well, the machine wasn't quite ready when I hired him. So for six months, I had him make stair treads the old way. <laughs> he had a table saw, a joiner, a surface planer, whatever he needed, hand tools. And he, and he learned how the wood reacts to the tool, how the tool reacts to the wood. And that's what you have to understand. Because uh, I know for me, uh, my woodworking, like my carpentry, didn't come from a classroom. It came from trial and error, a lot of it. And it was, you start working with tools and you start to understand grain and which way the board should go through the joiner and which way it should go plain by hand. It doesn't matter. It's, it's really knowing how to work with your materials. Work, learning how to work with the materials and hand tools is as important as learning how to use the power tools as well. They, they're going to be in, in, in sync. Um, pretty much now moving forward. Even well-known woodworkers, some of the mundane work, they would prefer to have it done with a machine, I think, sometimes, and then all the detail work, you still do it by hand. Um, there's nothing like cutting a crown molding with a coping saw and making it fit in that mite in that corner instead of taking a miter box and making a miter joint, which you never should do. Um, so, given this, what I've talked about, 
I, I, I I'll open it up to either questions or answers, but I'd like first I'd like to ask for any opinions about what you folks all think we could do to help enhance people to join the skilled trades. Anybody got any ideas? I almost feel like the misperception that skilled tradesmen are either not smart, not sophisticated, not classy, whatever it is. I, I kind of feel like something happened with our <coughs> parents' generation that they became they began to look down upon that. When your dad, who was obviously a skilled tradesman, wanted you to go to college, why? <coughs> My parents, and I come from a long line of carpenters, tool and die makers, and machinists, which both of my brothers are machinists, and my son is a machinist, um, that they wanted us to have things better. And World War II, and the fact that they saw the world, gave them a very strong impression that I had a tough life, came through the depression, all of that, but my kids will have it better. And it didn't necessarily happen. Right, and I think you're right. I mean, it's, not, it's not better. Right. If they made it different, and now we're starting to say it's not better. Recognizing that, I think, could give us the impetus to really boost the concept of going back to skilled trades among other things. Um, our little grandson, who is here today, uh, not right here, he's off with friends right now, but uh, he's definitely going in that direction. Right. That he and his grandpa have already built the tree house, and he's looking at that power saw and just can't wait. Right. And he's only seven. Right. You're right. I mean, my father wanted me to get a college education because he felt that it would be to my benefit. That it would be better. But, and I will tell you, and this is, another, this is, this is the kind of thing we have to solve. I, I went to the University of Massachusetts for mechanical engineering. I, love, I mean, I'm, I, I don't like, I'm not only working with wood, I love working on cars. I'll, I'll do anything. My wife said, I said, oh, that's broken. She said, what are you going to do? I'm going to fix it. You don't know how to fix it. I will fix it. I will figure it out. So I'm too cheap. It's that attitude. I can figure it out. Right. So burn that out. Right. So 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 I went into mechanical engineering, and I realized I love being in the shop, working with metals and so forth. I hated sitting in a thermodynamics class with 600 other students. And UMass is a good engineering school. I was going to leave, and I'm thinking, how am I going to tell my parents this? They're going to kill me. <laughs> Fortunately, they weren't paying for my education. I was, I mean, back then, I could, you could go to college for $2,000 a semester in a state school. Um, my friends uh, convinced me to stay in school. So I said, all right, where am I going to go? What do I want to be? I want to be a builder. All right, so I'll go to the business school. I'll learn accounting and marketing. And of course, a lot of what you learn in business school when it comes to the manufacturing side, is involved with factories where you can use a stopwatch and lighting makes a difference, whereas construction, it's a whole different ball game when you're out in the middle of nowhere building a house or anything like that. <coughs> and that was valuable. I didn't get a degree. Uh, I'm glad I, I took it because it did help me originally, eventually when I started a business. But when I made the transition, I think I gotta tell my parents. <laughs> and I expected, you know, the bomb to drop. And I was surprised. I got exactly the opposite reaction than I thought it would, I would. My mother was upset and my father wasn't, which didn't make sense to me at all. But then when he saw me move forward with my career, he kind of said, I get it. And that's the same story about this young man I talked about. When I, when I talked to his mother, I said, good for you for letting your son pursue what he wanted to do. And that's what we have to do. But the only way we can do that, I agree with you full heartedly, the only way we can do that is we first, first have to expose young people to these experiences of 
working with tools and figuring things out and doing that. And I think we're headed in that direction because corporate America, corporate America is finally starting to put money behind this. And some schools, the technical schools, some of them have waiting lists now. And the millennials who don't have jobs are looking for a new outlet. And we've done some research here at the village which says that millennials want to have more hands-on experience. So we're going to try to take advantage of that here, if we can, and create programs where they, they can have more experience. And so maybe they'll say, ah, the heck with my, you know, um, software degree. I'm going to go, I'm going to go build furniture, or I'm going to become a finished carpenter. So that, that, you're right. Thank you. Uh, the money. Yeah, you do make good, you can make good money. The fewer there are, the more. And, and encouragement. Yes. Yeah. Encouragement is the number one thing. It's, yeah. it's, I always say to my kids, uh, you know, I have three stepkids and a daughter of my own. Uh, so I'm not close to two of the stepkids, but the oldest and my daughter. I always said to them, look, I want you to find something that you want to do for the rest of your life that makes you happy. It doesn't hurt you in any way. That's all I care about. My daughter, we think she's interested in woodworking, pottery. My wife does pottery, pottery. No, total intellectual. I mean, she's a massage therapist. That's actually a skill in itself. And my stepson, uh, he went to Assabet Valley here in Massachusetts uh, for electrical. Uh, he worked with me, worked for me for many years when he was in high school. And uh, he has his own business in um, theater and structured wiring services and so forth. He's done really well for himself. So there are examples out there. Anybody else got some ideas? What do you attribute the accuracy and high quality of early pieces, is it to the, uh, uh, the person constructing the cabinet maker having extremely high quality tools and very sharp tools, uh, a very skilled person that had very extensive training, or just a good eye, or a combination? I think it's a combination. When I look at pieces of furniture here in the collection, many times when we were doing programs for the workshop and and the displays that, and, and um, exhibits that we've had here, and I look at the quality of the work, and I go, it, it's got to be all of those things. It's skill, it's um, a sense of design, it's um, using the right tools, it's all of those things all put together. For me, um, my wife's on my case all the time. I've built a lot of pieces of furniture to, because of the TV show, and I live with them every day, which is great. But I don't sign most of my pieces. In fact, I don't, I don't think I've signed more than a dozen pieces of my furniture. And she said, you should sign your pieces. And I said, you know, for me, the, when I look at furniture, I've looked at furniture here at Storybridge. I've looked at furniture in private collections. I've been to Wintertour. I've been all over the place looking at furniture. For, to me, the, unsigned, the, uh, the anonymous craftsman is my biggest inspiration. I think what's happened in society over the past generation or two uh, is the people not thinking of the, the trades as honorable work on both sides. People are not doing honorable work and two, the people thinking, you know, the, 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 the craftsmen aren't doing honor, honorable work. Which is good. <laughs> but we have a little bit of both. In any occupation, you're always going to have craftsmen who are not very good at what they do. Um, and we can't, it's hard to get around that. But for the craftsman who's trying his best to do the, you know, the right job for you, I, I always felt that if I was working in someone's house and my guys were doing work, if the homeowner said, just came in the morning and said, hello, and how you doing? And, you know, guys, looks like things are moving along nice. That goes a million miles to someone uh, being willing to, to do the best possible job they can do for that customer. But as soon as they become, they feel they're ignored. It's not that they're deliberate about it. I don't think they're deliberate about it at all. It's just, it, it, it just makes them feel, doesn't make them feel worthwhile. We, we've talked to people who have worked at our house and <clears throat> we'll say, you know, the restroom's there, if you want to eat lunch, you can eat it in the kitchen, whatever you want to do. And they go, they look at us like we're cross-eyed. And we say, what, what's the matter? He said, no one treats us like that. And that's sad. Because 
You can't be on both sides. You can't call up on the phone and say, I can't find a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter or a woodworker and at the same time, you know, treat, treat them like that. It just doesn't make sense to me. One of the things that I think is very important in addition to getting younger people more interested in the trades is getting some of those people who went to college yeah. and that kind of stuff. I mean I have that perspective because that's my situation is I went to college and now I'm going to North Bennett Street School. But uh, to, to consider and one of the things that the school says is do something that you love every day. And what did you make? today that you can look at and that you can be proud of. Yeah. Yeah, good point. And I also think mentoring is also you know, a oh, big yeah. part of this whole thing. And as I started thinking about this, working with my people and how we're trying to bring a lot of attention to this, to the opportunity as well as um, you know, where is helping people get to that, that place, is that you know, the, where we're really at risk is if all the really well, all the knowledge now, are in the people who are about to retire. Yeah. And that's dangerous. So I would like to try to figure out a way to encourage the mentors once they retire to say, look, you don't have to be out there every day like you've been for the last 50, 60 years, however long their career may be, but maybe it might make sense to, in your own community, to you know, go and talk to the kids at the schools, show them some stuff, um, do something like that. So that that, that whole, Pot of gold doesn't get wasted. How do we get back to the schools and and get and not necessarily get the 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 um, work of the wood shop back into the schools and stuff oh, because be they're always going to well. say there's not enough money. But we at least have to get the concept of working with your hands is a, is all right. Like so, it has to start with the guidance counselors. The people yes, that, absolutely. I mean, um, Mike Rowe is not a craftsman. I don't know how many people here know Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs, but he's very brilliant, but he's not a craftsman. But he's a great representative of people who work. And, if, and he did a thing, and I forget what year it was, you can search it on the web, on YouTube, where he testified before Congress, and he had a picture of the, the poster that was his guidance counselor came when he went to see his guidance counselor for a career. What his guidance counselor told him and what he thought it should be. And basically, if I remember correctly, his guidance, tell, guidance tell, teacher was telling him, um, don't work hard. Oh. You know, take the easy road. Don't work hard. Whereas, work hard. <laughs> Earn it. You know, it's like, I mean, I, I don't remember ever going to a guidance counselor, but um, you're right. I mean, the, the problem with it is money, but and budget, you know, the schools now, you read, open the paper every day, the schools are cutting money from the budget, the towns are cutting money from the school budgets. I think this, they could balance it a little bit better. I think they spend a lot of money on things they don't need to spend money on. I mean, I look at, I shouldn't criticize my own university, but I look at Boston, and I look at, you know, Boston's UMass Boston, and I see all these buildings going up, and I'm going, that's not where the money should be going. Yeah. You know, that's the wrong place. So um, it's not easy, but I think our best hope is corporate America. Yeah. Because when we interviewed CEOs down in uh, Florida at the Dover Show, even they were saying, we, I, I, I gave a short talk down there and I said, I love coming to this show every year, and the products and the new technology, it's amazing, but who's gonna know how to put them together? Who's going to know how to execute this stuff? And they know that they're running out of space. So they're, trying, they're taking more of the European model now, more of an apprenticeship type approach. I've only been, in the time that I've done stuff here, I was only in one company in uh, South Carolina, I think it was, that Bloom, and they make hardware. And they had an in-house training for all the people who would end up working in that company. So they provide the education, and they provide you with a job. One other thing that I didn't bring up, that I've talked about contractors, about where they should be mentors instead of criti criticizing people. A lot of attitude in the construction industry, and I'm sure in the workshops around, is when the young guy comes into the shop, it's time to harass him. <laughs> and you can't do that anymore. You know, it's like, teach him. 
don't make them feel bad. But on the other side, the students, I've run into students that have come to jobs, come work on projects that we've done, where just because they went to a technical school, they showed up and they had an attitude of, I know it all and I want top dollar. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not the way it works either. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have to do a lot of educating. So, uh, the first time I built a house, I was 15 years old, and I built it other career that I'm involved in, which takes me traveling and long-term jobs. And I decided to build a house because it was an easy job to get when my wife was eight months pregnant and I wanted to be sure to be home when the boy came home. I get on the job site and, you know, I have no experience building houses. I have other carpentry experience and other woodworking experience, but I've never built a house before. The guy asked me to build saw horses. I thought this is kind of traditional. And uh, at the end of the day, he asked me how long I would be staying with me, asked me if I could become one of his regular employees. I said, you know, I really can't commit because, you know, in three or four or five weeks, and in three or four or five weeks, I had gotten three raises. Most of the other guys on the job site had not shown up for work or dropped out or quit or any number of other things. And he said, how can I keep you? How can I get people like you to work for me? And I said, you have to pay more than $8 an hour. <laughs> And, and he said, I can't afford to. That's the going rate for a framer. And I said, well, right there is 70% of the problem. How can you attract people who are good, who are smart, who want to do anything except get their paycheck on Friday and drink it to come and work for you if you're paying $8 an hour? Second thing that I want to bring up is that <coughs> when you look at the trades before oh, the end of World War II and after, you know, drywall was something that kind of destroyed the plastering trade, and, and the modular electrical boxes, done, you know, everything is made dumber and dumber and more and more efficient and less and less involved in thinking. And thinking people no longer want these jobs. They want to jump up to being foreman that, so they can make money, or the contractor so they can do the, the organization and make more money, or doing the fine woodworking the trim. Nobody wants to be an hour, because $9 an hour, who the hell can make a living like right. that? Yeah, and that's another attitude that's going to have to change, is that contractors are going to have to step up to this, or they'll be like homeowners are now. They won't be able to find anybody to work with them. But, um, you know, <laughs> you're right about, uh, you know, the wages, I guess, is one thing. Um, Again, it's like, it's, 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 the problem is kind of global, so the contractors, you know, contractors don't have the resources generally to be the teachers, and that, I've heard a lot of people talk about that, and even when I was in business, it was hard to take the time to educate at the same time as you were trying to build, but I felt it was worthwhile, and, you know, more people will have to try to do that. Um, it, it's a challenge. But, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The one, the one last thing to go with that is that, you know, when, as, a, as a homeowner who understands the building trades, having, since I framed my first house, built four of my own, um, when I deal with my subs and I find out that, you know, my plumber, who is the only plumber I'll use because he's fabulous, works for a plumbing company, and the plumbing company bills at $90 an hour and he gets 17 which goes back exactly to my last thing. I mean, here's one of the most experienced guys I know. We're in a market where $17 an hour is a professional guy's wage, and that's what everybody gets. Right. And the, uh, the problem, too, I, I, I agree with you on the fact about, um, you know, the, I guess it's the, uh, I don't know how to get exactly how to put it. Huh? Corporate greed. Well, it, it is corporate greed. And also, I think there's another thing that's happened is uh, a lot of the, especially in housing, a lot of the regulations have caused um, the house the cost of housing to go up a lot more than, than before. But uh, the thing that I found is we started to research and find young people who could tell the story that we wanted to help other young people. I ran into the problem that's very parallel to yours because I looked through the list. Even though they were learning, now I'm, I also believe that a good architect has been a builder. Mm -hmm. You know, a good electric electrician knows something about electrical design. 
Um, you know, if, if you have some on-the-job experience, you become a better designer, you become a better foreman, all of that. Absolutely. But what I was discouraged with is as I looked through the list, I said, okay, she's learning a skill, that's great. Oh, she wants to be a manager. He's learning a skill. Oh, he wants to be a manager. And I said, we can't just feature these stories because if we, we can have all the managers in the world, if we don't have the hand, we're going backwards, we're not going backwards. <coughs> And again, I think it goes back, I keep going back to this, because it's about the experience. If you've never touched a piece of wood, if you've never had the opportunity to go into a shop as a young person, back to the schools again, it all goes back to the schools. And we gotta get, maybe corporate America has to start kicking in a little bit more because they're starting to feel the hurt now that they don't have the people to, to uh, do the, the things that they want done. Unfortunately, in the building industry, just like every other industry, um, Obsolescence in the technology side really bothers me because when you have a house and 20 years in, you know, your fire, your fire alarm system needs a couple new pieces and you have to replace the whole thing because you can't find replacement parts. That, that's a whole different story, but it kind of falls into the trades as well. You had mentioned the European system of apprenticeship, and I wonder if that's some kind of an answer to getting homeowners and people to believe that there are important skills that are required for these jobs that would help them be encouraged to pay enough if they felt like the carpenters and people they were hiring had these skills had the instead right of skills. just yeah, some guy that walked in the Right, around. you're right. You get the skills in advance and then when you show up for the job interview, you're highly qualified, you deserve to be treated that way. The European side is interesting. One of my neighbors, we stopped to talk to them, they're a new neighbor, and uh, they were from Belgium, and her parents were there for the weekend. And she said her parents did everything, you know, they, they, they could do anything around the house. And they were there to visit with their grandchildren, and they were painting the house and doing the landscaping. And so she said, yeah, my father said to me, so what did you do last week? And he said, well, we put up a shelf in the, in the living room. He goes, so what did you do with the rest of the 24 hours? <laughs> So, so, you know, it's like that, and she said, that's the attitude. I mean, if we had that attitude here, we, we, we'd have it made, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I grew up, a lot of you here in the same generation as I'm in, and we grew up with parents who were in World War II, and they could do anything, and, and uh, my wife always says, well, what do people do who don't have the experience you do? I mean, my father did everything. He could do plumbing, he could do welding, he had been a mechanic, um, and, he, and I turned into him because of, you know, if the plumbing breaks, I'll fix it if I can. And so uh, I don't know if we're ever going to get back to that level, but we certainly need people in the skilled trades uh, to, to um, do all these necessary jobs that make our lives comfortable, as Mike Rowe would say. And it's not just that. They're very rewarding, and, and that's the way they should go. Uh, I think there's also times total disconnect between what the needs are of a particular area and vocational school programs. I personally experienced that I haven't worked in the industry for a number of years. Where the vocational school is often carpentry and brick bricklaying. And the needs have radically changed. Mm -hmm. And I think it points to the fact <coughs> that the industry needs to get involved with the educational institutions. You know, the ivory tower in the real world right. really need to put it together. Yeah, and, and, and you can really come up with some good viable programs. Sure. I mean, in the old days, when I first started in this, when I started working with my father, we'd drive up to a foundation if we were building a new house. We'd frame it, roof it, put the windows in, shingle it, do everything except the mechanicals. Go to the next house. When that house was wired and plumbed, we'd come back. Talk about plaster. I'm old enough to have hung not wood lath, I'm not quite that old, <laughs> but I have hung rock lath. And I was always, you know, those were 16 by 4 foot sheets, and you nailed them up, and it was full two coat plaster, and that whole job I went all through that, that business. <clears throat> but um, now it's all so specialized that, you know, the corporations now, it's not like you're training someone to do all of those things. You, you have framers, you have electricians, you have plumbers. Some plumbers just specialize in heat. Some uh, specialize in just regular systems. So it seems like it would become much easier for the, for the uh, corporate world to get involved with that and help train those people. Okay. Uh, I agree with everything you've said and all the comments, 
But there's an irony here. The growth of DUI, the do it yourself, which your programs have pioneered. Well, I'm not sure. You know, I always, when we first started doing this all the house, people criticized us because we, they thought we were giving all the secrets away, and I felt that they were just being insecure. And that they're always going to be DIY people. And, you know, there's a certain group out there that. One, they might not be able to afford it. Two, they want to do it themselves, and it's the only way they can get it done. And I'm all for them. And maybe if we start educating young people more, they'll come in on classes and learn some more stuff themselves. 